everybody, and welcome to Push Collider Movie Talk. <laughs> oh my gosh, Movie Talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. Where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Greetings and salutations. That was her fault, by the way. Everybody, <laughs> welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. And we are so glad to finally be shooting this show. <laughs> also here is John Schnepp. <laughs> What's going on? Are, is this live? Oh, wait, we're not live. That's right. We could do this. Can we do this again? No, we can't. What's, what's going on? Also, here's Mark Ellis. Yeah, we're technically a little bit late in a clock terms, but in right. maritime nautical terms, we're actually three minutes ahead. Ah, you guys supposed to say it in a 20s accent, Mark. See, you're in maritime. See, I don't want you talking those nautical things. These whales, things. boys. Yeah. These whales. I'm feeling, they're very large, these giant whales. I'm feeling a little weird and sick if and queasy. you guys can see what actually happens here before we record. Okay. Hey, listen, as happens sometimes, guys, a couple things drop. Uh, after we had the show notes already done. And in this case, we had two significant new trailers drop. And we're going to start with the newest trailer for the upcoming film, Steve Jobs. The new trailer actually dropped this morning. Schnepp, you had a chance to just watch it. Your review of the Steve, new Steve Jobs trailer. It looks fantastic. I mean, I am primed and ready to see this movie already. I don't need to see any more trailers. Um, it looks fantastic. I think in this trailer specifically, they really go a little bit further into the sort of the darker side of Steve Jobs. They, a lot of his friends, you see them questioning him during the different three time periods that they cover in the film. So I'm really interested to see how this script plays out. I mean, already I feel like the cast is fantastic, so I think it's a fantastic trailer just to pique your interest, just to see a little bit more behind the curtain of Steve Jobs. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I loved this trailer. I, th I thought it was great. I thought it had its spine-tingling moments, especially if you know a little bit of the history of Apple and Steve Jobs and you recognize some of the scenes that are playing out and you know what's actually going on. Some of the conversations between Fassbender and Jeff Daniels, and those, I mean, you know who each of those characters are and mm -hmm. what goes down between them. And I remember when he unveiled in the trailer, I love that they showed this in the trailer, when he unveiled that first Blueberry iMac, mm -hmm. I still remember... Um, this is back when I was still a PC guy, but I still remember when they unveiled that and I was like, this is going to change everything like that. That one thing is a lot of people forget, like it's the biggest, most wealthy corporation in the world right now. A lot of people forget it was on the brink of bankruptcy mm -hmm. for a long time. Apple was and that little blueberry iMac changed their destiny like forever. It just changed everything for that company. It put them back on the map. It, I think it was the first thing that Jobs did after he returned. So seeing that in the trailer as well really kind of gave me kind of goosebumps at the same time. And, you know, it just kind of goes to show you that, you know what, you can have a movie that has a big actor attached, that has a big director attached, and they can lose that actor and director, bring in more talent, and it can still all work out just fine. Um, and the word we're hearing about it coming out of the Toronto International Film Festival is like way up here. Mm, like it's, it's astounding the reviews we're hearing coming out of that. So anyway, I love the trailer. I thought it was terrific. Can't wait to see the whole movie. As a guy that still uses Windows 95, this trailer <laughs> actually impressed me for two reasons. Is that one, I echo Schnapp sentiments when he said that you got to see the darker side of Steve Jobs. The initial trailer I saw for this movie, you really just had that one scene when it was... <laughs> By the way, this is Mark's computer. <laughs> My whole life. This is Mark's computer and... He runs Windows 95 on it. He does. He's that kind of an outside thinker. That's, uh, that's what you get for putting it back there every right. day. I, I want to apologize to all the girls out there. I don't actually drive a 2016 Ford Fusion. <laughs> it's a 2015. My entire life is a lie. Um, seeing the dark side of any boss, whether it's John Campia or Steve Jobs, <laughs> is so interesting. And they got into that a little bit more in the trailer. Plus, they showed the entire... You get to see what an ensemble picture, even though the name of the movie is Steve Jobs, what an ensemble cast this is going to be. Jeff Daniels, yeah. Kate Winslet, Seth Rogen complimenting Michael Fassbender's performance as Steve Jobs. He actually looks more like Steve Jobs when he's playing young Steve Jobs yeah. than he does old Steve Jobs. So that's surprising to me. I think it's going to be a black mask situation where once I get into the theater, I'm going to lose the fact that this is Fassbender and just accept that it is Steve Jobs. Well, that's what a good actor is supposed to do. Right. But am I the only one? I got the impression from this particular trailer. She looked good in the other one, too. But I got the impression from this trailer... Kate Winslet could steal this movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's yeah. talking about Fassbender, right? Everybody's saying how great he is in the movie. But watching that trailer, it's like, she could just sneak up and steal this movie because she looks really strong. All right, the other trailer that dropped this morning after our show notes were already done, it's going from greatness to greatness. We're talking about The Last Witch Hunter starring Vin Diesel. What are you laughing at? Starring Vin Diesel. The newest trailer dropped. 
I will lead this uh, this one off. Look, like most people, when we heard Vin Diesel's doing Last Wind Shutter, it sounded a little corny. It sounded like some one of the movies that Vin might have done after he first departed uh, the Fast and the Furious and he moved away from Triple X and stuff like that. And he, he had a string of films that weren't very good during that period. I mean, he, he'll tell you that. But I really like, I did, I'm not going to say I really liked, I liked the first trailer we saw. I really like this trailer. I don't know why, but I watched it. I, was, I thought some of the visuals in it were incredible. That mm. scene, when he pulls his hand out of the handcuffs and his hand's all mangled and it starts popping back into place, that looked ridiculously good. I thought like the burning witch looked amazing. The, some of the one-liners are great. I even found that corny, stupid line at the end when she's got him under in the dream state and she's going to take a selfie with us. Hey, witch hunter. He goes, witch hunter. It's like... <laughs> I think it's in Vin's contract that he can only say any line in that voice. Mm -hmm. Witch Hunter, happy birthday to you. <laughs> I'm pretty, but whatever, it worked for me. For whatever reason, it worked for me. The movie may end up being terrible. I don't know. All I can tell you is that these trailers are getting me excited for the movie, and that's the job of a trailer. So I dug it. Anyway, Mark, what did you think? I just it? want Nicolas Cage to be in this movie so bad, and he's <laughs> not. Um, uh, seeing this trailer, it felt a little clunky to me. Like, I still, I'm, 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 and I like when trailers don't give away too much, but so are we in a fantasy realm? Or are we in modern day? It, I wanted it to do a little bit better of a job explaining to me exactly what the premise of this movie is. He is the last witch hunter, and I think he's in modern day. The effects to me were hit and miss. Some of them looked okay. Really? The other ones looked like I was seeing the seventh <laughs> son or something like that again. So I, I can't. Can't like totally get excited about the last witch hunter, but if you tell me the premise is Vin Diesel and he's got this action fantasy realm that he's got to take care of, I'm gonna be excited about that. I just didn't love this particular trailer like I wanted to. Schnapp, don't be talking trash about the Seventh Son. Uh, <laughs> I know you guys had a great day. That in Jupiter ascending. Uh, look, you know what? Watching this trailer, I, I agree with you. Some of the effects were hit and miss. I love I love Vin Diesel's like doing his Chronicles of Riddick with the Necromancers. He's a sweaty, weird D and D freak. <laughs> so you know that's why he was like glomming onto this. He was like, "Let me play a witch or whatever, witch hunter." Um, I'm all for this film. I'm super excited about this film. I absolutely hate this trailer. <laughs> why do I hate this trailer? The visuals look great. I think Vin Diesel's awesome. Everything about this is amazing, except for that song. <laughs> that song. That song kill. I like the remake of Painted Black. All right, I can. I, I got the beginning of the music. All right, all right. It's like, and then all of a sudden it breaks out of that. That was actual uh, the lyrics too. It was Those are the real I, it lyrics. Ruined the I trailer for me. That's why I'm selling this trailer. We're not even buying and selling it. I'm selling it. I don't care. What if the actual Stones version is in? The it would have been awesome. Okay. All right. I don't. I. I felt like I was watching like a 2003 or 2004 trailer where every single, you know, it was like the bodies hit the floor. Like what every trailer had some kind of like neo metal type of, that's actually more metal than this. This was like that like wispy kind of, I don't know where I am with a guy chugging the guitar in the background. I hate that See, kind of music. Yeah, and I hated the, the social network trailer when they had the radio head, but it was, the, it was like a choir version of Creep. I didn't like that either. Just play the original song. Yes, please. I got to say, I, okay, while I agree that when, there's two halves to the trailer. The first half, it was just like the piano. Dun, dun, right. dun, that didn't dun, bother dun. me. No, I actually really liked it. I thought Paint It Black, yeah, The Witches are coming, go. Destroy the Makes World. Sense. I didn't like it as much when it broke into the song, but I still didn't mind it personally, but I can see why it would rub some people the wrong way. It just ruined the trailer. I was like, please, let make that stop. I felt like my skin was burning. I felt like, I'm being possessed by the Black Witch or whatever. Just like... I don't ever want to see that. We trailer were watching again. it in the studio, and he was literally like doing <laughs> this. It was like, should we call for help? I I, I don't. <laughs> All right, let's get on to the first official topic of the day. All right, as most of you know, Channing Tatum is coming to the big screen in October of 2016, but he'll have to do it without his director, Rupert Wyatt. Wyatt, who directed such films as Rise of the Planet of the Apes and The Gambler, came on the project back in June, but according to a report in Variety, a script change caused the budget to escalate and increase the shooting time required for the film. Then the start of production was pushed back from this on November to early 2016, which prompted Wyatt to say the following. I was very much looking forward to working with my friend Channing and the team at Fox, but regrettably a push in the start date now conflicts with another project. I thank them for the opportunity and I know that Gambit will make a terrific film. John, should fans be concerned over the departure of Rupert Wyatt? 
No, absolutely not. Should we regret the departure of Rupert Wire? Yeah, sure. He's a, he's a great director. I was really looking forward. I was excited to hear that he was on Gambit. And I had a bunch of people tweeting me this morning saying things like, oh, the production of Gambit's in, in trouble. They're a problem. No, they, they did a script rewrite. Totally normal. It increased the scope of the film, which we should be excited about, which was going to make it a bigger budget of a film, which we should be excited about. And they had to move the start date. And because of the shift in start date, remember, these Hollywood guys, be they actors or directors, whatever, a lot of these guys, they have their schedules down to the day about when they have to get off this project, start on this one, all that kind of stuff. And when you take a big major project like Gambit and you move it three, four months, that is inevitably going to conflict with something else. And so unfortunately, Rupert had to step off. It's really unfortunate. Like we just talked about the Steve Jobs trailer. David Fincher was going to direct Jobs. And now we got Academy Award winner Danny Boyle directing it. Everybody's raving about the film now. So this won't hurt the film. So should we be concerned? Absolutely not. There's nothing to see here. Is it unfortunate that we're losing a director of that caliber? Absolutely it is, but let's see who comes on next. Mark, what do you think? There is some tea leaf reading you can do with this, though. I mean, first of all, you shouldn't be panicked if you're a Gambit fan because there is a precedent, even within the comic book film universe, when Ant-Man came out and we lost Edgar Wright. And we're like, oh, God, this movie's going to be a disaster. It ended up being awesome. So you can make a good movie just because the director leaves. But with 20th Century Fox recently their that last comic book movie they made had a lot of problems with the director yep. they chose to hire so somebody who's a higher profile name like Rupert Wyatt leaving the project it totally makes sense that they pushed back the schedule and it, it couldn't jive with his calendar but if you're also talking about making a, a, a bigger budget or making script changes and then Fox brings in the key is who do you bring in it's not yeah. that Rupert Wyatt's leaving the project it's who do you bring in he worked on Rise of the Planet of the Apes when they made the sequel to that he wasn't able to do it but who did they bring in they ended up making a great movie so if you can do that again, I think I'm still on board for Gambit. I've got yeah. a suggestion for you guys. Why don't you bring in Brett Ratner? Because then you do that with X-Men Last Stand. You pushed <laughs> off Matthew Vaughn. You got that dude. The rat came in and rocked out the last stand. I, he might be available to kick it. I know you guys have scheduling conflicts the and stuff. The rat came in. Yeah, that's his company's rat, ca rat Pack. He can rock Yeah, Rat Pack or something like yeah. that. His name is production company. So uh, you know what? I mean, this happens all the time. You're right. Is there something more to it? Probably. But it's also, you know, I'd say it's, 98% true, 2% like, what? You know, desks getting thrown. But that happens with all these kinds of productions. You know, there's always, a, when you push something even one month and a, and a director or, or an actor or a writer or a producer is supposed to be like, I'm supposed to be on this other project, they usually try to make it work. But this looks, it sounds like November, December, January, push at least three, three months. months. That can ruin somebody's, you know, next three projects. So it makes sense to me. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about, uh, you know, a lot of this, how we evaluate this event is going to be based on who then comes in to replace him. Right. Because if a Matthew Vaughn, for instance, mm -hmm. who Fox has worked with many times, comes on board, we're all going to go, oh, okay, no problem. If it's like Tim Story, who Fox has worked with, right. comes in, we're all going to go, oh. Hey, like, he's got a lot of, uh, you know, he's done a lot of these superhero movies, John. I don't <laughs> know why you'd be experience. so worried about it. Hey. <laughs> all right, what's next? As most of you will remember, it was recently announced that Legendary Pictures was taking its long gestating Kong Skull Island project from Universal Studios, who decided to drop out of the project, to Warner Brothers. The speculation was that the move would open up the possibility of a Kong vs. Godzilla movie down the line. Now, The Hollywood Reporter is claiming that the script for the new Kong movie does indeed contain references to the organization known as Monarch. Some of you will remember that Monarch is the organization that Ken Watanabe and Sally Hawkins belong to in the recent Godzilla movie. Sources all t also told THR that Legendary is confident it can come up with a rationale to explain how Kong and Godzilla can do battle and possibly become allies. Mark, is it now pretty much inevitable that we're going to see a Godzilla versus Kong movie in the near future? I just can't stop smiling about this. <laughs> I cannot stop smiling about this. Even though some of the things of what Ashley just said, like them teaming up, becoming allies, I'm like, ah, let's pump the brakes on that. I want to see King Kong and Godzilla in the same movie do battle, and I want a clear winner. What The only thing that concerns me about this is that they're making multiple movies to set up this franchise collaboration. So you got to make sure Skull Island is good. Mm. You can't just have it done. I love the first Godzilla, or the Godzilla that came out recently. That Not everybody did. You need to make sure that the movie's leading 
leading up to this collaboration are good and that they're not just setting us up to see King Kong versus Godzilla. Let's make Skull Island good on its own. We can have Godzilla come in later. I cannot wait to see this when it happens, though. Schnepp, this warms my heart. I am also <laughs> like, as a little kid, monsters were my, were my big thing. I had the rubber Godzilla. I had the, you know, the set where I, you know, King Kong put them together, you know, and I, I'm horrible at, at putting plastic kits together. But I, sir, I did a Godzilla, a Ghidra, a King Kong set. So <laughs> Mothra, you name them, I had all those creatures. So I cannot wait to see King Kong versus Godzilla. And remember, the original one in Toho, Godzilla won. In America, King Kong won. They had to seek, this was one of those movies that actually had different endings for where, where they released the film. So they might do the same thing here, but I think whether who it doesn't matter who wins, they are going to team up and fight Ghidra. So that to me is like I okay, might be yeah, seventy five years yeah, old. Yeah, I do want to see them team up and fight. Ghidra. <laughs> you know, you have You're to right. say they yeah. have to fight. Yeah. It's going to be Superman versus Batman. Same thing. They're going to be like, bro, we just had a battle handshake. What dark side? You know, you got to have that Ghidra floating in with a weird electrical ah, three heads. Those guys in the saucer are like we must destroy Earth. It's going to be insane. But I'm going to be seventy when this comes out. Get Get on it. Come on. Get on it. Oh, I, all the only thing I hope is remember in some of the cornier Godzilla movies, Godzilla had that atomic drop kick where he would stand there first and then rub his feet against the ground. Yes. And then go and then run and then just do this drop kick that would fly 5,000 feet. Sure. Like, a complete vertical line and yes. drop kick dudes. That's where Liu Kang learned that move in Mortal Kombat. That's he, right. He'd use his tail to like help him. Oh, yeah. The kind of deep balance is yeah. flying along the air. Like, actually, the biggest question that has risen at this table and amongst a lot of fans has been, well, wait a second. Godzilla is like 10 times the size of King Kong. Like, you're going to need a Kong the size of the Empire State Building, not a King Kong who hangs off the Empire right. State Building for something like this. Now, it was in response to that concern that this quote from a source at uh, Legendary said, Legendary is confident that it can come up with a rational, with a rationale to explain how Kong and Godzilla can do battle. So I think what that means is, look, Kong was in development the script was done, everything, before it was ever moved to Warner Brothers. So I'm pretty sure that one concern of yours is that, hey, don't just make this movie a build-up to the, to the fight. I think they're going to have a good self-contained movie. But I think one of the things we're going to see in the Godzilla sequel is some kind of nuclear radiation, whatever, that shrinks Godzilla. I think sh Godzilla is going to... like shrink about half or two thirds or something like that. Because as things stand, Godzilla would step on King Kong. So you gotta King come Kong's up with quick. That. He's quick, man. He's athletic. He's, yeah, he's, right. he's or flexible. He's maneuverable. Or they're gonna take what they already had in the very first Godzilla where you saw that little vial or that that said Mothra. So Mothra is supposed to be the villain right. of the sequel to Godzilla. What they're gonna do is like maybe set the groundwork with Kong Island, discover this giant, this giant race of apes, and then feed them that same serum or whatever, make them get bigger. All I know is this. If you love post credit scenes, buckle your seatbelt. There's gonna be there's gotta be a great post credit scene yes. after Skull Island. Like, yes. oh my god, where's the monster? Dun dun. It's yeah. gonna be great. Or Godzilla's gonna be in it. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's him narrating it. All right. What's this narrating it? What's next? Speaking of legendary and universal, no, no. reports have emerged that the planned sequel to Pacific Rim has been put on an indefinite hold with no active plans to go into production. Blasphemy. The original Pacific Rim film made just over 410 million at the worldwide box office, but carried a budget of nearly 200 million, making the margins very small. The film also would have lost the company a lot of money were it not for a late, strong showing in the Chinese market. Schnapp, how do you feel about the cancellation of Pacific Rim 2? <laughs> that good, huh? <laughs> I'm pissed. Me and Dennis were ragging on this, like, what the hell, man? Stupid. <laughs> it's just, I don't have any I'm wordless I have nothing I'm angry um, I wish I could say I was shocked but but I'm not I mean for a long time I didn't think Pacific Rim 2 would, would get a sequel at all and I remember us saying look it's got to at minimum get to 400 million and it didn't look for a long time like it would even get to 400 million and then it did really great in China which kind of pushed it over the edge but barely 400 million is a great number Unless you spent two hundred million to make the movie, and then probably about forty to fifty million dollars to market the movie, then you take one third of that four hundred million off. Suddenly, 
you you didn't lose money. I mean, that's the best thing you can say about Pacific Rim is that it didn't lose money. But true to Guillermo del Toro's style, I mean, Der, del Toro said this many times. If he does sequels, he wants to go bigger and better. And I know Legendary was apprehensive. I mean, that's one of the reasons Legendary has never greenlit his his proposed Hellboy three movie because he wanted to make it much bigger, much you know, much better. And they're like, we, this just, the box office returns don't justify it. And I was still, even though it hit four hundred million, I was a little bit surprised that they greenlit lit a sequel. I'm not shocked. I'm disappointed. I'm terribly disappointed but not shocked that they've pulled the plug on this. At least the official word is on indefinite hold. That means they don't, they don't even have any plans to get this thing going yet, but it could resurface its head at some point. Uh, who knows? Maybe get involved in this whole Kong Godzilla shared cinematic universe. I don't know. Maybe it's Kaiju that they got to fight. Who knows? But uh, it's unfortunate, but I'm not surprised, Mark. I'm not shocked either. But I mean, again, if you had to get this news, which is disappointing news, because I like Pacific Rim, there's a lot of lore that you could have explored there in sequels. But if you had to get this news, if this bomb had to be dropped, what better day to do it than the same day when we get King Kong <laughs> versus Godzilla? I, when I was a kid, I asked my parents for two things one Christmas. I wanted a terror dome from G.I. Joe, and I wanted the Millennium Falcon. I get downstairs, and there's no Terror Dome. And I'm like, oh, man, that sucks. But what is there? A Millennium Falcon. If you gave me King Kong versus Godzilla or Pacific Rim 2, I'm taking King Kong versus Godzilla all day. So I thought I might get one movie. Now I don't get that, but I get this other movie. I'll take that. Good point. Yep. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Ashley, what do we got? A brand new trailer for the upcoming Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks film Bridge of Spies has hit the web. Set against the backdrop of a series of historic events, Bridge of Spies tells the story of James Donovan, a Brooklyn lawyer who finds himself thrust into the center of the Cold War when the CIA sends him on the near impossible task to negotiate the release of a captured American U-2 pilot. The film hits theaters on October 16th. John Byer saw this trailer for Bridge of Spies. Bye. It's fantastic. Love this trailer. I loved it even more than the first one. Uh, uh, this is great human drama, and it kind of sets up. I love it when you have a movie that is, you know, kind of endorsing the idea that heroes aren't just in physical action. Heroes are men of, or men of principles, or people of of morals, or people who stand up for something. And what this trailer, it actually gives me hope in humanity. Mm -hmm. Seeing people like that, and seeing even just in a movie context, a character like that, it reminds me a lot of the. Oh, uh, why uh, Atticus Fitch in um, To Kill a Mockingbird? That's that's what Tom Hanks's character reminds me of a little bit. Not on the same scale, but it reminds me of that I love this trailer. I hope we're going to see it and it's going to get Oscar buzz if the movie's any good. But we'll see. But Spielberg and Tom Hanks, how bad could it possibly be? So for me, it's a big buy. Schnapp. I agree. It's an incredibly well crafted trailer, and this is the way trailers should be made. I mean, we've been going on and on about how these tra newer trailers they show you everything in the movie. Now, this is a crafted trailer that introduces the storyline, introduces to you to the main characters, and then they build it with not just by showing you a whole millions of different scenes and then possibly the ending, but they build it by like, what are the conflicts? They tell you what the conflicts are between the characters and who their loved ones are and what the conflicts are between, you know, Russia and America. And they just build it the way a master craftsman has to build something. So, I mean, this this looks amazing. It made me think about things while I was watching the trailer. Mm. I did think about our society, America now. It, it, so many things that movies are supposed to do really well when they do them right. This is this is that movie, the, an incredible trailer. Yeah, I mean, I, I buy it. There weren't as many Skull Island references as I wanted. <laughs> um, but this is a huge buy for me. And yeah, totally. We've seen so many trailers recently just throw the entire story at you and give you all these little tidbits that we didn't need. We were already going to go see the movie. Bridge of Spy is a perfect example that you can do a trailer too. You can sell a movie without giving away too much. They set up what is going to be happening, but I have no inkling as to what's actually going to transpire in any of those scenes. What is going to be the outcome? You have to pay to go see the movie. That's what I want from a trailer. I am teased. I am ready to go. This could be, like you said, an Oscar-winning film. Because remember, Tom Hanks, he's got Oscar pedigree. Steven Spielberg has pedigree. <laughs> the story that they're telling, historically based during the Cold War, this thing has nominations written all over it. 
All right, what's next? A brand new trailer for the upcoming Ron Howard film In the Heart of the Sea has just hit the web. Set in the winter of 1820, In the Heart of the Sea follows the New England whaling ship Essex as it is assaulted by something no one could believe. A whale of mammoth size and will and an almost human sense of vengeance. The real-life maritime disaster would inspire Melville's Moby Dick, but that told only half of the story. In the Heart of the Sea reveals the encounter's harrowing aftermath as the ship's surviving crew is pushed to their limits and forced to do the unthinkable to stay alive. Braving storm, starvation, panic, and despair, the men will call into question their deepest beliefs from the value of their lives to the morality of their trade as their captain searches for direction on the open sea and his first mate still seeks to bring the great whale down. Mark Byers saw this new trailer for In the Heart of the Sea. Well, I don't know if you guys can tell, I'm kind of a fan of maritime disasters in movies. And uh, <laughs> I, I totally buy this trailer. I love watching this thing. This is another trailer that just got me so locked in. I need to see this movie. Now, I'm so happy. Even though I could have seen this thing months ago, then they pushed it back for Oscar consideration. And it looks like that was the right call because this looks phenomenal. When you have a director like Ron Howard and Chris Hemsworth, a star in his own right, plus the way the whales looked, like the effects, how big that giant, the, the great fish, Look, I want to see this thing fight King Kong and Godzilla. This is, I, I am so excited for In the Heart of the Sea. Now, it is definitely one of my most anticipated of the fall after seeing this trailer. Yeah, not many people know it's actually a practical effect. <laughs> the, the whale is actually a giant physical whale. No, um, I saw this. Look, a lot of people talked. This movie was supposed to come out in March. And I was really disappointed when it got bumped. Number one, because like the week before they announced the move, Ron Howard uh, did a... Uh, opening for our, for movie talk right. of course you remember that ron right, howard right. was kind enough to do an opening for movie talks hey movie talk fans may you check out my my new film in the heart of the sea opening in march but because they moved the date we had to pull that spot and couldn't use it anymore i was like damn for them moving it um so the the speculation the question was did they move this movie truly for oscar consideration to to take it or at least to take advantage of the oscar consideration they believed it was going to get or was it because of problems? And after watching this trailer, I can wholeheartedly say it was because of Oscar consideration. This trailer is fantastic. Ooh. I was I was just devouring every single frame. It was tense. You just felt it. And then that one shot, when that the whale is up on its side and looking with its one eye at Chris Hemsworth, and Chris Hemsworth, they beheld each other. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> oh man, it's, it's like the farmer and babe. Uh, like, like, <laughs> like as they be no seriously man it was, <laughs> the weirdest comparison I've ever heard in my it's not life necessarily going to make the front of the poster right. you know? that was the line they beheld each other ah but babe I I loved it I cannot wait to see uh, the direction this movie goes Ron Howard thumbs up super excited big bye for me yeah bye for me as well this trailer is epic this trailer is what you a return to epic filmmaking with it, where it just feels in scope and size and everything about it. The one thing that bothered me, no cast with lightsabers. I felt bad for you, Mark. <laughs> um, the one thing that bothered me for me was there was a shot where Chris Hemsworth. It looks like they've been out to sea for like forty days, and he's completely clean shaven and completely good looking. And we were talking about like even with a beard, he's incredibly he's like godlike. <laughs> I was like, how did he have time to get all shaved Dude, up? Dude, I'm everything? telling you right. If you put Chris Hemsworth on a boat for two months, he's gonna look exactly like he does in this movie. Right. He is a god, and you should res respect him. As he well. willed yeah. his beard yes. to shrink just, back yes. into his face. This movie looks fantastic, and I, I agree. They pushed it back for Oscar consideration because it feel, it just has that weight to it. I mean, all the scenes with that whale in it are terrifying. But so, I'm pulling yeah. for the whale. Like I watch the trailer and I'm rooting for the, for the whale because these guys, you see them like throwing spears into like the whales, you know, his brothers or his sisters or whoever, and then the whale is just getting revenge. So I am on Team Whale as of right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. What's next? I'm on Team Whale too. <laughs> it has been announced that the upcoming Olympus has fallen sequel, London Has Fallen, has now moved its scheduled release date of January 22nd, 2016, to March 4th, 2016. The story begins in London, where the British Prime Minister has passed passed away under mysterious circumstances. His funeral is a must-attend event for leaders of the Western world. However, what starts out as the most protected event on Earth turns into a deadly plot to kill the world's most powerful leaders, devastate every known landmark in the British capital, and unleash a terrifying vision of the future. Only three people have any hope of stopping it, the President of the United States, his formidable Secret Service head, and an English MI6 agent who rightly trusts no one. Schnett Byersell, London has fallen, moving back to March 4th. 
That's for Oscar consideration, guys. That's, <laughs> that's obviously why they moved it. My brain has fallen. I hate this series. I don't want it. I don't care about it. <laughs> Stupid and dumb. Sell. I buy it. <laughs> um, after watching, you remember those two films came out, White House Down and, uh, right. uh, and Olympus Has Fallen mm. came out. And I saw, I made the horrible, tragic mistake of watching White House Down first. Oh, boy. That was criminally bad. Okay. And then I kind of took a pass for a while on Olympus Has Fallen. And I finally got around to watching it. I, I, look, I'm going to tell you, I'll admit, I liked it. I liked Olympus Has Fallen. I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was everything White House Down should have been. I thought the action was insane. It was hyper violent. Um, the one liners in it were actually clever instead of the ones we got in White House Down. I really enjoyed the film. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, go, Tom jumps on my top 20 all time favorite action films, not at all, but I, it ended up being an enjoyable film for me and I ended up looking forward to it. The notion that, okay, now there's another, you know, global disaster going on here in London and only the president of the United States right. and his Secret Service agent can save it. Delicious, I say. That sounds delicious. Mm. How Morgan Freeman fits into that with Gerard Butler and Aaron Eckhart, I'm not sure. But I, here's the reason I'm buying the move, though. I think a lot of times we see January as the graveyard, mm -hmm. where studios send a lot of their movies to go die. I mean, you're going to be pitted up against you know all the Christmas movies that are still going to be on here. I mean, Revenant's going to be out. Hateful Eight's going to be out. Star, Star Wars. Wars is going to be out, blah, blah, blah. Them moving that out of the graveyard to March, closer to the summer season. And remember, every year, March is becoming more and more part of the summer movie season, right. as it turns out. Moving it to March tells me they've got more confidence in this movie than they did before. So for that reason, I'm going to give this move a buy. I mean, why else would you move it? Like, I, I'm not buying this move because I want to see this in January. This is like why I was looking forward to January. <laughs> I already have, March is already covered, okay? Yeah. Between college basketball and that little Batman versus Superman movie coming out, my March is already said. You didn't need to throw this in here. And just hearing the explanation of what this movie is, if you close your eyes and you didn't know who was in it, I would have assumed it's a sequel to White House Down as opposed to <laughs> Olympus, Olympus is, fallen. is Fallen, because it, this sounds ridiculous. I hope they treat it with some semblance of realism. Like, give me a little bit of that gritty, realistic, not first much. few diehards in there. <laughs> Have fun with it, but let's make it a little realistic here. All right, what's next? According to a report in Deadline, Universal Pictures is developing a new version of the classic Christmas Carol story in the film of, in the form of <laughs> Humbug. The report claims that the film will star Ice Cube as the Scrooge character, who in this rendition of the story is a successful real estate mogul. Staying true to the original story, Scrooge is then shown the error of his ways after visits from three different ghosts. John Barcel, the idea of Humbug starring Ice Cube. All right, first of all, let me say this. I'm actually a big fan of Ice Cube. <laughs> Um, Ice Cube was kind enough to get together with me and Dennis, uh, actually, uh, last year. And he was gracious and funny uh, and just terrific. A lot shorter than I thought he would be, too. But just he's, he's terrific. <laughs> Ice Cube playing Ebenezer Scrooge sounds like something out of a Ben Stiller movie to me. Um, I, I got, so this is weird and odd. So I'm going to sell it. But with the giant asterisk beside it that I don't know what their full concept of this, I don't know what their vision for this is. This could be a brand new Christmas classic. But until I get a, a little bit of a peek as to what their vision for the film is and what it's going to turn out to be, it just kind of sounds a little bit silly to me for now. So for now, I'm going to sell it. But I am looking forward to seeing you know, the first pieces of promotional material as it starts coming out, say, six months from now. And then maybe we'll change our minds. For now, this is sell. Mark? I'll buy it because Ice Cube, though he does have a winning smile, rarely uses it. He looks, <laughs> he like, looks a like a Scrooge. I, this is a true story. One time I was on a plane flying back from a gig in Charlotte, and I'm walking past first class. I myself was sitting in coach and sitting on this side of the cabin is LL Cool J and on this side is Ice Cube. LL Cool J is literally high-fiving everybody who's walking on the plane. He's having a great time <laughs> taking pictures. Ice Cube is sitting there with the classic Ice Cube frown like somebody gave him a, a warm Coors Light. Like he just looks so <laughs> upset. <laughs> and, and, and But then he would like take a picture if you asked him and I didn't ask him but like he just seems like the guy that you have to convince to be happy and to celebrate life. So that's why he makes sense in a modern day retelling of Scrooge. It, by the time this movie comes out, it's going to be almost 30 years since Scrooge Ed with Bill right. Murray came yes. out and was the comedic version of that. So I think it'll be about time that you get a new telling of it. So I will buy it, particularly if Dr. Dre plays any one of the ghosts. And don't, forget, <laughs> don't forget Michael Caine. I believe it was Michael Caine in The Muppet 
version of Scrooge That's as right. well, which is That's actually right. surprisingly and good. And Zemeckis just recently did that all 3D one. With Jim one. Carrey? With Jim Carrey. That yeah, was incredible. That was Visually, it was stunning. I totally buy this. I think it's perfect casting. Ice Cube, look at that sour face. <laughs> yeah. He's Scrooge right there. I mean, his, him always like, man, what'd you do with that thing? You know, like, if you go back to any one of the roles that he played, except for like Triple uh, X2, um, he's sour. He's always like complaining about stuff. Like, I can't believe you did that. Even in 21 Dr Jump Street. It's flipping tables. How dare you date my daughter trying to kill people? Yeah. Are we there yet? Are we done yet? Yeah. I. So I think if they do it right, you're right. I mean, I'm buying it because I think Ice Cube can actually do this character great, being just a sourpuss, a penny pincher. Like, I can't believe you spent all this money. And then the error of his ways for being selfish and, you know, uh, not looking, kid, taking care of his family. Who knows how they're gonna, what they're gonna do, how they're gonna update it. I, obviously, I, I feel a, they'll do a modern version of it. Uh, Doctor Dre should totally be Jacob Marley. That's who he should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that people forget too about Ice Cube is that he is a writer as well. Mm -hmm. He he yeah. is he's a creator. Actually, some going back to like Twenty Two Jump Street, he came up with a lot of his own lines in that movie, but also what I thought was the single funniest line in 22 Jump Street, I heard them telling the story about this, he actually came up with, it was in that scene uh, when they're in the restaurant having dinner and there's a buffet and he's like, what does man gotta do to get a glass of water? And then what he said in between takes apparently was he told Jonah Hill, hey, hey, say, somebody get this man a glass of water, he's black, then pause, then go, He's had a very hard time. <laughs> and, oh. and then, so that so then they play out that scene, and it, it, it sure enough, it, to me, it was like the fun, the funniest moment in that film was in Channing Tatum. The bell goes off, and he realizes yes. that yes. Jonah had slept with his daughter. But I thought the funniest line <laughs> of the scene, like Ice Cube is quick, man. He yeah. comes up with some really funny stuff, and it would be interesting. I'd like to see him bring a little bit of his humor sensibilities to the movie. That could be really cool. I, and yeah, I mean, you're bringing that up makes me want to see who are they going to cast as the ghost. Yeah, let's have Chris yeah. Tucker. Let's have his Friday. Why not? <laughs> Get all of them. Yeah. Get Bill Murray to be one ah. of the ghosts. Wow. Get now, Bill Murray to be we one of We are cooking up a delicious stew of a Christmas. <laughs> ride show. along. Who's the guy in Ride Along with Kevin him? Hart? Kevin get, Hart. Get Kevin Hart Let's to be one of those ghosts. Not get Kevin. No, Hart. No, you tired of him? No, no not yet. Kevin but I'm Hart. getting close, so I, I don't want right, to get overburdened right. with Kevin Hart because I want to appreciate him for a lot more, a lot longer. All right, folks. Listen, it is Thursday, which means it's time for us to talk about the film's opening up and wide release. It's opening this week. Brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, on Tuesday's installment of opening this week, we, of course, talked about the new Johnny Depp film, Black Mass. But we got a couple more to talk about now that are opening this week. So, Ashley, what do we got? First up is a new sequel, Maze Runner Scorch Trials. Transported to a remote fortified outpost, Thomas and his fellow teenage gladers find themselves in trouble after uncovering a diabolical plot from the mysterious and powerful organization Wicked. With the help from a new <laughs> ally, the gladers stage a daring escape into the Scorch, a desolate landscape filled with dangerous obstacles and crawling with the virus-infected cranks. The gladers' only hope may be to find the right hand a group of resistance fighters who can help them battle Wicked. Also opening this week is the new film Everest. On the morning of May 10th, 1996, climbers from two expeditions start their final ascent towards the summit of Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth. With little warning, a violent storm strikes the mountain, engulfing the adventures in one of the fiercest blizzards ever encountered by man. Challenged by the harshest conditions imaginable, the teams must endure blistering winds and freezing temperatures in an epic battle to survive against nearly impossible odds. Schnepp which of these films should audiences be looking forward to? Wow, well, Everest looks like the most intense of the two. I mean, if you watched, if you saw The Maze Runner and you're into that, I mean, I saw the trailer for The Scorch Trials and I, it looks really fun. It looks like a fun action adventure, science fiction, post apocalypse film with a bunch of kids who have to figure out how to get into the wicked, uh, you know, whatever. It looks <laughs> fun. And so, but the Everest or Wendy Lee was actually saying the guy who discovered it is Everest, is actually how you're supposed to say it. But yep. I guess we'll always call it Everest, won't we, guys? Um, <laughs> however you're supposed to say it, I'm not climbing that thing. And the idiots who do do that deserve a movie made about them. So I'm going to go see, in a safety of a theater, air conditioning is the coldest it's going to get for me. I'm going to watch this adventure. So, um, You know, Maze Runner was one of those really crappy-looking films that 
turned out to be actually not that bad. It was actually all right. I am personally, look, I didn't go to see Scorch Trials. I, was, I missed the press screening for it. Um, but I'm actually kind of looking forward to seeing it. But yeah, the one I'm really looking forward to more is Everest. Uh, it just looks intense knowing that it's based on the true story. Um, kind of gives you a little bit more of an emotional pull to it as well. Mm -hmm. And you look at this cast, Jason Clark, Josh Brolin, John Hawks, Robin Wright, uh, Emily Watson, Kieran Knightley, Sam Worthington, um, Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal. Gyllenhaal. I mean, it's it's an inc probably, it's safe to say, the most impressive ensemble cast and we're going to see in a movie this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the one I'm looking forward to most. You actually saw Everest. I've been to that beast. <laughs> Your thoughts on these two films? Well, I mean, look, Maze Runner was another movie that, yeah, I actually like Maze Runner and I didn't think I would. The end of Maze Runner is totally just like waving a giant flag that says, hey, make sure you come back next year because we're making a sequel to this. It was so setting up for a sequel that how could you not want to see this sequel that they're trying to sell us so hard a year in advance, The Scorch Trials. Having said all that, did I sleep through my screening of The Scorch Trials? Maybe. I <laughs> totally missed that screening, but I did see Everest. And Everest, you have all these stars in the movie, doesn't matter. The star of the movie is the mountain, and they direct it as such. The cinematography is breathtaking. You feel like you're up there eating a York peppermint patty at the world's <laughs> peak. And so it's a movie that I can recommend to go see in the theater. It's the theater experience you want. It is based on a true story. So you're not necessarily going to get a glossy over it. Oh, everybody is, is going to be happy high-fiving at the end of this movie. There's going to be some stuff that happens. There's some stuff that goes down that is not pleasant, but I think it's worthwhile to see in a theater. Did you see it in an IMAX presentation? I I saw in the IMAX experience, which isn't right. like, it's not true IMAX, but it's like, hey, this is more than a normal movie theater, so it's that in-betweener. Yeah, I remember I got a text message from, uh, from Wendy Lee back there saying something, I've never been so mad and so sad coming out of a movie. It's like, those, that's great when a wow. movie can list that kind of an mm -hmm. emotional reaction. I cannot wait it's to It's a good education, this. too, because it doesn't do it in a boring way, but it really <laughs> teaches you what you go through if you wanted to go climb Everest. Like, you get there two months ahead of time, and you have to train on the mountain. You actually train <clears throat> on Everest to be able to climb it. And it's just, it, it's fascinating. It's stuff I didn't know, and now I will know forever. Yeah, stuff I, I'll, I'll never do. Yeah, it sounds like a good <laughs> education. The lesson, don't climb Everest. <laughs> Stay away from that that's mountain. That's your education today, right. folks. Well, folks, listen, that'll do it. We don't have time to get to mailbag questions today. Don't worry, we will have them back again tomorrow. That'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater show time and of course your movie ticket information. Make sure you guys subscribe to this YouTube channel. Click that button. Become a subscriber. You keep up to date on everything we got going on here. We had Heroes this week. We had Jedi Council this week. And last night, if you're a fan of the show Empire, last night we de debuted our Empire Recap Show, a special season two preseason episode. So make sure you jump on and take a look at that. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys uh, can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp, and go get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, at www.tdoslwh.com. You'll find me and Holly Payne at the Rose City Comic Con this weekend in Portland, Oregon. So if you live in Portland, Oregon, come to the Rose City and say hello. We'll have a booth. We're doing screenings and all that. And of course, sitting right over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Uh, online at 5150 Ellis on Twitter and Instagram. And this weekend, I'll be here in L.A. telling jokes at the world-famous comedy store on Sunset. And at the end of the table, of course, as always, the lovely Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you online? Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Thursday, guys. And uh, you guys can check out my new novel, The Pride, that's coming out here in just a couple months. Head over to kickstarter.com and just search for The Pride. You can support the project and, of course, book your advanced copy as well. On social media, you can follow me on Twitter and on Facebook, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Collider Video. Until next time, bye-bye.